So I will welcome us again tonight. Tonight we are going to discuss racism and voter suppression. It's a joint venture between the Ashtabula NAACP and the Ashtabula County League of Women Voters. Uh, this evening we have Dr. Rhonda Matthews and Ms. Kalitha Williams with us. Dr. Rhonda Matthews is an Associate Professor of Political Science in Women's Studies at the Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice at Edinburgh University. Rhonda has been with the university since 2002 and served as the Director of the Robert C. Weber Honors Program for three years. Prior to her work at Edinburgh, she taught at several other institutions and worked in the fields of diversity affairs and residence life. Rhonda is, a dedicate, is dedicated to advocacy and empowerment of women and children as the result of her previous work as a sexual assault survivor counselor. Using tenets of intersectional analysis, her primary areas of act academic interest include gender and women's studies, sociological theory, popular culture, and stratification. She's a longtime fan of science fiction, superheroes, and comic books, and is married to a badass man who together are rearing one badass daughter. And I can speak to her badassery because she was a mentor of mine in, uh, as an undergraduate and a master's student at Edinburgh. So my, my relationship with Rhonda spans 20, 20, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Miss Kalitha Williams, who I found doing internet sleuthing, trying to find an expert to help us uh, this evening, has extensive experience in electoral work. She began her career as a fellow at the Ohio Legislative Service Commission and has a strong background in advocacy policy leadership from her previous positions with the Ohio House of Representatives, the Col Columbus Urban League, and the Ohio D uh, Domestic Violence Network. She is a partner of the Change Agency, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization charged with increasing the civic and political participation of young Black professionals in Ohio. She's an inaugural member of the Columbus Young Professionals Commission, former Political Action Committee Chair of the Ohio Conference of the NAACP. She serves as a member of the African American Advisory Committee of the Wegsner Art Center at The Ohio State University. Ms. Williams has a bachelor's degree from Denison University and a master's in public administration from Central Michigan University. And we're very, very lucky to have both of these amazing women with us tonight. I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Williams and I'm actually going to really give her the, the reins as I make her the host so she can share her presentation. Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here and have an opportunity to talk with you. I'm really excited about your partnership. Um, I have a long history with the NAACP at the local and the state level. Um, and I have some great experiences with our legal women voters in Ohio, uh, Central Ohio, I believe it's Metropolitan Columbus, um, where there was a time when I was a member and got a chance to organize some candidates forums with them. And at the state level, I'm with an organization where I'm their chief lobbyist and I had a great opportunity to work with the League of Women Voters of Ohio. Um, the staff and leadership, they are just amazing and do amazing work. Um, so I'm just gonna try to share my screen. Let's see how I do this. Should oh, be it done. Looks like someone's trying to come into the waiting room. I just let them. Know. <laughs> Wonderful. I may have to. You may be in charge of muting folks too, though, so you have all the power. Okay, I'm having problems seeing where I can share my screen. If you float down. Oh, to I the see bottom. it. I see it. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I am not the most. A uh, technologically advanced person. So there is a presentation and I will put it in presentation mode. Great. So can everyone see uh, the screen? Great. Um, so I'm just gonna dive into it. Um, this is a quote from uh, one of my uh, advocate mentors um, I can tell you, you know, I've been a public policy advocate at the and a registered lobbyist at the local, state, and national level for about 20 years, but I'll always see myself as an advocate. Um, and one of my advocate mentors always says, if your vote doesn't matter, why are people trying to take it? Um, we know that voting is one of the important tenets of our democracy. I mean, it's important that we protect it for all Americans. 
this is just, I thought I'd go through a, a timeline around suffrage in our country. And I think um, when we're being clear about the founding of this country being based in white supremacy, we clearly see that in who at the establishment of our country had the, the clearest way um, and right to vote. Um, when our country was founded, cit uh, citizenship, excuse me, voting rights were exclusively for Christian white male property owners age 21 and older. That's a pretty exclusive group of people. And then through the timeline, you see it expanding to more. So um, in 1856, all white men. In 1868, we see the 14th Amendment granting citizenship to former African slaves. And then in 1870, um, the 15th Amendment around uh, the federal government not being able to deny the right to vote um, based on race, you know, so many years ago, but even as these laws were being passed, we can see clear examples in our country of people obstructing those rights. Um, I found an interesting fact about Susan B. Anthony and Sojourner Troop who worked together um, to try to advance suffrage and actually being arrested. Um, I know from your work last year, um, there was a celebration of 100 years of women receiving the right to vote. But when we talk about who those women are, we're talking about white women because women of color were not included. And in many cases, um, women, different women of color weren't even considered citizens of this country. So the right couldn't be expanded to them. Um, Native people in this country didn't even receive full citizenship until 1924. Um, and through my reading, I learned that there were earlier opportunities for indigenous people to receive the right to vote, uh, to have citizenship, but only if they would renounce citizenship to their tribe. I mean, you can imagine that being a terrible obstacle for someone to have to deny their culture and their sovereignty to be a citizen of this country. Um, Asian Americans were being were granted the right to citizenship through legislation in 1952. 1964, poll taxes were outlawed. I mean, can you imagine not to, that's not too many years ago. Um, the 1965 Voter Rights Act outlawed um, barriers to keep people of color from voting, including um, lots of uh, voter suppression tactics that I'll mention um, in the presentation and gave the US Justice Department preclearance authority so that communities that had a history of voter suppression tactics towards people of color, specifically African Americans, and had low African American voter registration and participation rates before they could change their policies on voting, the United States Department of Justice had to oversee, had to review them and give approval before they could be implemented because of the history. Um, in 1971, it's, this predates me a little bit, um, but the voting age was lowered because of the Vietnam War. You couldn't, people said, how can we compel people to fight in this war and they not have, and they don't, they're not even able to vote. Um, more recently, uh, many of us recall in 2013, um, the Shelby County versus Holder case that went to the United States Supreme Court that actually rolled back the provision in the Voter Rights Act that gave the United States Department of Justice preclearance power so that states, and we've seen this, began rolling back um, and implementing additional uh, voter suppression tactics in their communities. Um, and I, you know, I love to quote people I admire and the late great RGB 
I had her own comment and, you know, she had a strong dissent against that Supreme Court ruling and said throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. These policies were working. The enfranchisement of voters, African American voters in communities that have been plagued with voter suppression um, had, had definitely had definitely increased voter participation. And unfortunately, that's why there was a consistent effort to roll them back because they were so effective. Voting is power. It's an opportunity to select leaders that represent your values and beliefs, to advance policy practices and programs that help our families, neighborhoods, and communities. Voting is power to ensure we have a government that works for all of us. Voting is a critical tenet of our democracy, engagement, and opportunity for all of our citizens. When we talk about, you know, old voter suppression tactics, we saw things like grandfather clauses in Jim Crow, where if your grandfather couldn't vote, you can't vote, poll taxes where people would charge fees to very unfortunately poor people of color, African Americans to have to register to vote, reading tests. And this was a challenge when you talk about very low income people of color who had very low literacy rates, forcing them to prove that they could read in order to vote, white primaries, and then just blatant violence. Um, people who were threatened, people who were killed, people who experience all types of violence, different types of intimidation, people who were scared of losing their jobs if they registered to vote. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to some of my older relatives and they told me stories about how they would encourage their children to be members of the NAACP, but as adults, they knew they were risking their livelihoods. And so while they encouraged their children to join, they didn't feel that they could join. You know, many of us know that the NAACP was considered a terrorist organization in this country because it had the audacity to fight for policies like ensuring that African Americans were enshrined um, and had the opportunity to vote. <clears throat> so new voter suppression tactics we're seeing now, voter roll purging, voter identification laws, all in the aim of preventing voter fraud, a problem, a solution to a problem that really doesn't ex exist in a measure that needs to be addressed policy-wise closing polling locations. Um, we see that all of a sudden you live in a community and you've been voting at the same polling location for years and then all of a sudden they close your polling location and merge you to other locations and maybe they're overcrowded. We see these long lines. Distribution of polling machines. Do Is there adequate distribution of polling machines in different locations to ensure there are not low along lines? Are all the old polling machines being located in communities of color and causing breakdowns? There have you know, been quite a few reports of this. Um, I was sharing that I had a great opportunity to work with Jen Miller at uh, the executive director of the League of Women Voters Ohio, and I admire her greatly. And I remember when she was first telling me about this, um, you know, last year, um, right before the election, the state of Ohio was planning a purge. And there, and again, the goal was to purge people from the rolls who had not been voting. Um, and many of you probably were a part of the fight to stop Ohio from pur these purges. And the Secretary of State, Ohio Secretary of State LaRose did something that I, he had, the Ohio had never done before and released the list in advance of being a purging. And that was an opportunity for advocates to look at the list and see, are there people who absolutely should not be purged? 
And lo and behold, Jen Miller was on this list. And she talked about um, how she had not, she was surprised to see herself on the voter roll because she had voted in th the last three recent elections. There's no reason she should have been on a purge file for people who have not been voting. Uh, the League of Women Voters, along with other um, good government organizations, found that one about one in five people on the purge list were going to be purged erroneously. And that includes a huge chunk, about 20,000 active voters in Franklin County. I live in Franklin County. Um, and when I first heard about this, I'm like, oh my God, let me look and make sure they're not gonna purge me. And I like Jen vote in every election. So what is the impetus around these purges? Um, and these, a lot of these other voter suppression tactics, it is this myth about election and voter fraud. Um, the Brennan Center for, Just, Center for Justice, an internationally recognized good government and democracy uh, research institute, conducted a groundbreaking study, The Truth About Voter Fraud, and found that the incidences of election and voter fraud are so, so small. It's, it's again, it's, it's policymakers trying to create solutions for a problem that is almost negligibly in existence. This is another one of my favorite uh, people. I admire her greatly. I, I just love Shirley Chisholm. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring in a folding chair. So I have some calls to action. Um, and I know um, a doctor, uh, Jessica, talked about, um, I know you're, the League of Women Voters is actively advocating for pass the For the People Act, um, House Resolution 1, Senate Resolution 1, which is focused on creating a national standard for voting and hopefully to work to prevent the, the multitude of um, voter suppression legislation that's currently in state legislatures in 43 states um, in this country. I think I read that there are about 250 bills currently in, that have been introduced across the country in state legislatures to make it harder to vote. And this national legislation, of course, um, we know that national legislation supersedes state and local legislation. And the people who are advocating for this bill just want to ensure that we're making it as easy as possible for people to vote and exercise this important citizenship right. The legislation has already passed the House but it is still pending in the Senate. Um, and I'd like to encourage you and all your friends and your neighbors to reach out to our US senators and let them know that they should vote for this important legislation and that you support it. Um, to be honest, I'm pretty sure Senator Sherrod Brown is already on board, but we might need to push Senator Brown to make sure that he supports this important legislation. Call to action in Ohio. I would encourage you to stay connected with the state organizations in which you're already involved. The League of Women Voters in Ohio, the Ohio Conference of the NAACP. And keep in, keep in the loop with them and get ready for action. As someone who lobbies at the State House, unfortunately, bills can move very quickly. Um, so always be ready for action to raise your voice with your state policymakers so that they know um, they know what your thoughts are and that you care about voting rights and expanding opportunities for people to vote in Ohio. 
Um, and then a local call to action for your local community. I always encourage people to maintain relationships with all of their elected officials. And where voting is concerned, um, you know, make sure you're engaged with your local board of elections. You know, attend their meetings whenever there are discussions, whenever there is a plan to make changes in your local community about voting, the board has meetings to discuss it. They have meetings, they have to vote on closing polling locations. They have discussions about the distribution of polling machines. When they are discussing contracts on purchasing new voting machines, they have to have a discussion about that. They have to vote on it. Um, and I didn't put this down, but another group of people to engage around your voting are your county commissioners, because many of them provide funding to your board of elections. You know, this is also an opportunity to present to them with the expertise that you and your organizations have about voting in your community. Um, a lot, unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but um, most boards of elections are full of political people, right? Um, the makeup of a board of elections is typically half Republican, half Democrat. And sometimes uh, their work can get very political and organizations like the NAACP and the League of Women Voters, you inject a nonpartisan voice into their work and keep them honest and keep and make sure that they're advancing their work in a way that benefits all people in your community, regardless of their political affiliations. And I just want to close, when we vote, we win. Um, this is a, I encourage everyone to vote in every election, encourage and help others vote. And as always, I always encourage people to vote early so you can volunteer on election day. This is a picture I volunteered at a, on election day this past year, um, like I do every year actually. And the polling location that I volunteered at, this was the line. Um, we counted 200 people in line to vote. And it was exciting. I, you know, there was an issue at our, the polling, lo uh, at actually all the polling locations in Franklin County, the electronic voter um, voting books all stopped working. It was terrible. And there was a young, there was a group of young men and, uh, when they heard what was going on, they're like, oh, forget this, we're leaving. And an elder turned to them and said, get your behind back in this line and vote. And they did. <laughs> and uh, that is that is the um, power of advocates and organizations like yours, um, really supporting our young people and encouraging them to vote. And I, when I look at this line, it just reminds me of the perseverance that people had in voting in the middle of a pandemic, a health crisis, an economic downturn, a racial reckoning. People came out and voted like they never voted before. Um, and we just have to encourage that and resist every effort that um, full voter participation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And I think I'm going to mute the person that called in just to just until Rhonda uh, is finished up with her I think, did I do it? Yes, I did it. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Williams. That presentation was wonderful and it gave us um, some of the history. Um, while you were speaking, I did post in some of those calls to action. So they can be found on our website as well. Um, those calls to action uh, directly coming from the National League of Women Voters and the state level League of Women Voters and the NAACP has been uh, an in integral part in, in these um, movements for advocacy and policy changes um, to really, uh, 
enfranchise and, 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 and bring, make it easier for folks to vote. Um, I'm going to turn over power now to uh, Dr. Rhonda Matthews and let her, and at the end of the presentation, there will be a time for questions. And if folks wanna post questions in the chat, I will monitor that as well, but we are also going to hopefully open it up so you can ask our guests questions um, in a bit as well. Okay, can I share now? No, I think I, oh, there's lots of things moving. Um, I'll look for the. I'm going to give it to you, right? No, there we go. As people come it. in, as people start coming, there's a, a few folks joining late. So um, there we go. There it is. See, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for the little button. Okay. You're in charge. So thank you. Um, so there is um, there's a bit of overlap, a good bit of overlap between the uh, information that um, that uh, Ms. Williams has given to you and that I'm going to give to you. So we're gonna have some overlap, which means I'll go a little bit quicker so we can get to a point where if you have questions, you can um, you can ask or, and so we can maybe even have a, a bit of a discussion here, okay? So let me share my screen here. Okay, so, the franchise, right? The right to vote. Um, the the purpose of the franchise um, is uh, the bare minimum exercise of citizenship. It's the it's the the bare minimum that you can do. It's the bare minimum of responsibility that we all have uh, as citizens um, of this country. Now, when I talk about citizenship, um, I do mean technical legal citizenship. But I also mean um, uh, I also mean acts that constitute citizenship, because there are many people um, who are residents of this country. There are people who are permanent residents here, who live here, who are not um, legally citizens of the United States. They may be they are citizens of other countries, but they participate. Um, they um, they act and they contribute. And uh, their work is the work of citizenship as well. So, so rather than um, having a narrow definition of citizenship that is, you know, constricted to, you know, a legal um, position, um, I'd like to think about. Um, I'd like for us to think about citizenship in terms of action, and that includes people who are not necessarily. Um, "Quote unquote legal citizens." So, Ms. Williams gave you all the history of voting in America. Now, I want to say this before I, I go on. I have four slides here that have uh, dates in the timeline of significant dates about voting in the timeline of the United States. I want you to understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg when we talk about the history of voting in the United States. Yes, we start at 1776, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, this does not end um, even at this moment. We can put significant events on this timeline of history in voting, uh, of voting in America uh, that happened last week, right? So one of the things that I want you to understand is that um, the question is not, settled. And the question about voting is not settled because at its foundation, we are still practicing, um, uh, we are still practicing um, supremacist attitudes, white supremacist attitudes, um, actions, and policy. They inherit, um, they, I'm sorry, they don't inherit, they inhabit our structures, they inhabit our institutions. Because if the question of voting um, was settled, we wouldn't even be having this forum tonight. It's still a question that is up in the air. And that is fundamentally because our structures um, are constructed so that certain people in this country are not considered to be full citizens. Certain people are not considered to be equal to other people. And that's the root of the matter. That is the foundation of the entire discussion that uh, we're having, not just here, but writ large. 
Okay. So traditionally in the United States, we didn't vote. We just, we're not, we just don't vote. Uh, we are apathetic, especially um, as it uh, pertains to um, um, presidential elections, right? Uh, not, not presidential, I'm sorry. Uh, any elections other than presidential elections, we're apathetic. When we are compared um, to um, other countries that are similar to us in economic status, uh, in population, in education, et cetera, other countries far exceed uh, our voting patterns, our participation. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there are many countries that do not have the types of economies, the advanced economy that we have. There are countries that have much larger populations that we than, than what we have, um, that have higher, consistently higher um, participation in voting. That change um, first in 2008 um, with the election of President Barack Obama and the elections that surrounded his ascension to, uh, to the presidency um, dropped again in 2012, um, but it skyrocketed this year around this presidential election um, and both some of the state, local and local um, elections that preceded it and then um, that accompanied it. Um, so you can see, this is from the, um, from the Pew Center. Um, and you can see that in the 1980s, you know, we were around, um, I don't know, 66, per, I mean, 54%. Um, that number went up this year. Um, and let's be extraordinarily honest about why it went up. It went up because the Republic was in danger. And it was the first time that people who are not regularly engaged in politics could see it, right? Um, you know, people like me who are kind of steeped in this stuff and who are engaged in this stuff all the time, you know, we're kind of running around when the shake people, ah, you know, we're, we're in trouble, right? Because we, we study this stuff and we're steeped in it. And, you know, we could see it coming from years ago. Um, but what happened um, during um, the Trump administration was that everybody else knew, right? I mean, it took a cataclysmic event to put the Republic in danger, to get people out of their seats and involved in the business of a participatory democracy. So our voting, our modern voting statistics uh, have uh, increased and not only have uh, we begun to vote in higher numbers, we also um, have uh, increased our participation in other areas uh, of democratic uh, redress, right? So, so while we're here talking tonight about voting, I do want you to understand that voting is the bare minimum, right? We, in order for the, the society for, the, I'm sorry, not even just the society, let me back up. In order for uh, the Republic to run as is outlined by the framing of the founding documents, we are supposed to participate at all levels, right? You're supposed to be participating from uh, the day after you vote through the next day that you vote, okay? So I wanna talk a little bit historically now because, because one of the characteristics or one of the, um, um, one of the factors that we're talking about tonight is racism. So I want to start here uh, with the with the Reconstruction era, I, because what happened um, during Reconstruction was telling. Um, it gave us a, a, a brief snapshot about issues of race and identity and power and policy and political action. So the end of the Civil War here, you can see all these dates here, the end of the Civil War, April 12th, uh, 1861. Emancipation occurs uh, in, well, I'm sorry, the Emancipation Proclamation is put into effect in um, 1863 um, federally. One of the things that people don't know much about emancipation though, is that uh, everyone was not emancipated uh, at that moment. In fact, um, different states have different emancipation days because at the state level, what uh, many of the people in uh, 
systems of governance and leadership did was not tell people who were enslaved that they were free until after, um, sometime after um, 1863. So uh, in some states, Emancipation Day might be 18, in 1863, in other states it might be in 1865 or whatever, okay. So, because um, um, you see, it's, it was signed in 1863, it went into effect in 1865. All right, so reconstruction occurs um, roughly from 1863 or 1865, depending on who you ask, through 1877. So roughly a 13 year um, time frame. Um, during, um, during this time, that says 1966, that's not when the 14th Amendment was passed. 14th Amendment was passed um, in 1866, uh, and it was ratified uh, in 1868. Um, the, the 14th Amendment is instructive for um, a few reasons, right? It's got five articles in it, um, but uh, I'm sorry, five sections in it, and it's got three major provisions. Three major provisions are uh, accounted for um, in those five sections. The first is the citizenship clause. So what the 14th Amendment did was it granted citizenship to, citizenship to all persons who were born or naturalized in the United States. So if you immigrated here, you know, and you went through the process and, you know, you became a citizen, that's naturalized. The second thing it did was it constructed the due process clause. So what the due process clause does is it protects people from the state's um, propensity to deny a person life, liberty, uh, or property without due process of law. So it was a federal um, protection to keep states from basically from going back on um, going back on federal law, such as the Emancipation Proclamation. And then the third thing it did was it gave us the Equal Protection Clause. Um, again, this is a protection from the state. Um, by the government, by the federal government from states. So the state may not deny um, a person, I can't, I got my light in the way, um, uh, a person within its jurisdiction, the uh, equal protection of the law. So, okay, so states can't make a law for one person because of X characteristic and another person for Y characteristic, okay? So the Fourteenth Amendment is important. Um, also, there is a um, there is a um, documentary on Netflix at this moment about the Fourteenth Amendment and kind of the breadth and the depth of it. All right. So now, so what happens after you know during Reconstruction? Well, people were who were formerly enslaved were freed, right? Um, the Fourteenth Amendment comes along. Uh, some of these people get the opportunity to vote, right? Um, black men um, in, you know, in this, this, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? In this, you know, kind of block of amendments get the right to vote as well. And a funny thing happens when formerly disenfranchised people are given the franchise. We start to see more significant participation um, in our political and governing processes. So this table uh, is, uh, gives us how many black office holders there were at the state level um, during reconstruction. Look at these numbers. In Mississippi, y'all, there were 226 black men elected to state office during reconstruction. We are only talking about a few years after emancipation. People are given the opportunity to participate, they participate and it starts to yield results, okay? Federal office holders during reconstruction. Again, look at this list. Jess, you want me to let um, people in or can you do it? I cannot, you have to do it, I'm sorry. All right. All right. <laughs> the, 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 um, the plague of being the host. <laughs> okay, Okay. so listen, I, um, I, I don't know what a timber agent is, but, but I know that there, there was one who was black during reconstruction, 
right? So we see, um, we see the outcomes, right, of participation um, in the franchise. Okay, now let's talk about, let's go back to federal and talk about black members of Congress. Alabama, okay, three, three black men from Alabama. Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi. Um, Hiram Revels uh, was actually a senator. Um, and in fact, um, the, uh, the building that housed the honors program at my alma mater at Alcorn State, Mississippi, uh, at Alcorn State University in Mississippi uh, was named after Hiram Rebels. North Carolina. South Carolina. More South Carolina. Okay. So one of the things, let me go back. One of the things I want you to understand here um, from this historical perspective is the power of the vote. Uh, when people are given the opportunity to vote, they exercised it, right? The other thing that it, do that it does is it places um, representatives of underserved communities or oppressed communities in the very positions of power that are necessary to represent those people. And so what happened during reconstruction is that we saw movement in that direction, okay? That is, and we're just talking about politics. We don't need, we're not even talking about what happened economically and in terms of education and other um, major social institutions um, in the United States, okay? Um, after Reconstruction, right, because there is an after, because there was a Reconstruction, the, the, um, the proof was in the pudding, so to speak, right? What we saw was that voting works during Reconstruction, that it places people in the halls of power, it gives them representation that is important, right? It moves people towards equality and equity. So in our system, it had to be stopped. So after Reconstruction, we see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council, and other uh, racist white supremacist um, organizations whose sole purpose was to roll back these gains. Um, and they started, one of the things that they started with was the vote. So um, Ms. Williams talked about uh, these different historical types of voter suppression. One of the things I wanna talk about just for a second, I wanna point this out to you because I she put on her, um, on her PowerPoint violence and I put it here too. Here's what I want you to understand. When we think about lynching in the United States, we kind of think of it as, you know, some, you know, kind of, th these were some individual racist people who, who, you know, hated black people. And so they did this thing. You, you need to understand that, that though, yes, there was some of that, the vast majority of, um, of, of violence against black people, specifically lynching was done to A, intimidate um, and keep them from, from uh, their full participation, not just in the franchise, but in the political uh, system and the social system writ large. The other major reason for lynching was to take Black people's land, right? Okay, so just so you know that. Gerrymandering uh, is one of them. These are um, recent uh, gerrymandered districts, okay? Now, let me also say this. Um, that there have been gerrymandered, there have been districts that have been gerrymandered um, by both of the major political parties. Um, but in the last 25 to 30 years, the primary uh, gerrymandering efforts have been by the Republican party. And that's what's drawn out um, these, these um, nonsensical um, districts, right? Except they do make sense, right? They make sense because they capture Republican voters. Okay. All right. 
play this. Oh, what happened? Oh, it just stopped. I have no idea why. Um, what he does is he asks her to name them. Um, and she picks up and um, leaves because of course she can't name them all. Um, the, this is the thing about modern, I mean, about historical, um, hang on, here we go. Historical um, voter suppression, right? That it took many forms um, and that people who were at polling places, people who were in power at polling places um, had uh, the leeway um, to throw any obstacle that they possibly could um, in a potential voter's um, way. Um, and that was from uh, the movie Selma. Um, and it is a dramatization, but it is a dramatization based in fact. Um, okay, so now let's talk about modern forms of voter suppression, um, which uh, Ms. Williams also talked about. Um, stringent voter um, ID requirements, reduced polling places, reduced um, voting days and hours. Um, in Georgia, one of the most recent things um, that they did was they restricted um, voting from Sundays because um, one of the things that a lot of Black churches did is a, um, a movement called Souls to the Polls um, in which there was a concert, there's a concerted effort to have transportation. So you go to church and then there's transportation there to take people to their um, buses, to take people to their voting places. Um, so there, so there are many more types of um, forms of oppression now. Many of them mimic a lot of what happened uh, historically, you know, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, this is from um, the uh, the Washington Post. Um, this is uh, beginning of March, March one. There have been at least 250 new laws proposed in states to limit mail, early in-person, and election day voting. 250, that is not a typo. I'm sorry, this is not from March 1st, this is from March 11th. Um, in these states, there have been restrictions um, proposed to mail and early voting. That's 33 states. Um, there are uh, limits to uh, mail and early in-person voting in um, these other states here. One of the things that, uh, that it's, um, that's important to note is um, the states in which, um, the states that uh, President Biden won and the states that uh, former President Trump won. Um, there are 16 states currently that require an excuse to vote absentee. Um, one, of the, one of the forms of voter suppression is to limit um, no excuse voting, right? That you just, I just want a mail-in ballot, send me one. Um, and the states are in blue. The states that are in blue right now all have restrictive bills in their legislatures waiting to be passed, okay? There was also, there was also uh, two weeks ago, a, um, a, a, uh, an Arizona case um, that is, the Arizona case seeks um, voting restrictions um, and it went to the Supreme Court. Um, in the argument before the Supreme Court, uh, this was, this was part of, the argument, right? So, and I am going to read it. I know it's sitting here, but I'm, I'm going to read it. I looked for the audio, I couldn't find it. What's the, um, what's the interest of the Arizona RNC, Republican National Committee, um, keeping in keeping, say, the out of precinct ballot disqualification rules on the books? And this question was from Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Um, the defense lawyer, states, quote, because it puts us at a competitive disadvantage relative to Democrats, end quote. Politics is a zero sum game and every extra vote they get through unlawful interpretation of section two hurts us. It's the difference between winning an election 50-49 and losing an election 51 to 50, 
end quote. So right there uh, in the Supreme Court, um, the attorney for the Republican Party basically said, we, if we don't get this, we will lose to Democrats. We need to rig the system in order to win, okay? So this is where we are now um, in terms of voting, who gets to vote. We're not just talking about, um, we are not, we are no longer just talking about um, voting, nor in fact, have we ever just been talking about voting. We've always been talking about systems of power, always. Who gets to access it? Um, who gets to name a thing? Um, and who gets to place restrictions upon a, um, a right that has over the years been granted, right? So that's really what we're talking about now. Um, and in the United States, um, with the ways in which the demographics are shifting, um, this, is, this is a kind of a last grab for power, right, to maintain power um, over a system in which many people think that they are losing power because they don't wanna share it, right? So uh, if you can attack voting, if you can attack people's ability to participate in a system that is designed for participation, then you can rig the game, okay? So I'm gonna stop right there and see if anyone um, has any questions. Mm -hmm we have any discussion. Do I need to, can you take, uh, can you take the power back, Jess? <laughs> I, think, I think I can hit reclaim. There okay. we go. There go. I have a quick question. Um, on one of, one of your um, screens, you mentioned um, the bean jar for voter suppression. Could mm -hmm. you explain that please? Um, there was a jar of beans in, in um, many of the polling places in, um, again, this is throughout the South, but um, th they would have a, a jar of beans there. Um, and when um, Black people came in to uh, attempt to vote, that was one of the questions. How many beans are in the jar? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, that was one of them. The, the literacy test. Um, there is, I can't remember which PBS station, but uh, there is um, there's a copy of the literacy test. You can actually take it. Um, it's like 67 questions, um, but that was one of the, uh, one of the voter suppression tactics. Um, yeah, this, but that's what, that was one of them. I do say that Mary made a disclaimer about the, the partisanship, but I will say um, on, one, on one hand, um, there, there has been, at least I watched it all in. Um, there, I, what I posted, I gave you guys a Padlet. I, I am a, um, for those that know me, a curator of things. And during the pandemic, I have found some, um, some sanity in sorting. And so I, that's what I can do. So I have sorted and I have found resources and I've put films and podcasts and, and um, academic articles and news articles and books. And so anybody that wants to dig deeper into these topics can. And one of the things that I found interesting and, and I think this kind of might buffer a little bit that may be partisan is we don't know really um, there isn't evidence to say that more Republicans wouldn't vote too. <laughs> so there's this idea that, you know, they're, they're saying it and they're calling it out in the Supreme Court as far as an argument. But there's also this idea that, you know, it could very well benefit both parties if everybody voted. And so we want to see more voter engagement. Um, and that's the stance of the league to making it easier. Um, but we're coming up against walls of um, oppressive forces that are saying, no, we need to make it less easy for folks to vote. And so that's when it does become um, somewhat partisan. But the advocacy here is that everyone has an equal opportunity to exercise their right to vote. And I think sure. that's important to say. Well, sure, I, I think that's important too. But I think it's also important to point to point out that facts are not partisan, right? Um, they if facts are what they are, right? Facts aren't Republican or Democrat. 
Um, and we have a historical record. We have a cultural record. We have a political record that bears out these facts. Here's the other thing. Um, the, 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 the statistics do indicate that if, that if we have full participation, if we have full unrestricted participation um, of people who are legally able to vote that Republicans will lose. We do know that. That is a, that is a demographic fact. Um, the ways in which party, uh, party uh, affiliations are changing, um, the realignment in ideological stances of the party is, of the parties is, is part of this discussion. Um, but, but that it is a, it is a statistical fact. I do think you're right. I think that there is that, that some of that fear, um, some of the fear is unfounded because I do think that there would be that more people, uh, there would be more people who were voting Republican. Um, I think that's absolutely true. I also think that there would be more people who were voting for the smaller parties, the Green Party, uh, the Libertarian Party. I think that that would happen too. But all of those things mean a division of the votes that go to the two major parties. And if that is to occur, what the statistics indicate is that the Republicans lose, right? They do. And so that's not partisan, that's just facts. One of the other things that, um, and, and, and so we are running up against the eight o'clock hour and I do wanna give an out for folks that wanna go, but I'd like to see the conversation continue. So as long as folks wanna continue the conversation, um, I'd like to kind of push, push this a little bit. Um, I had a, a pretty good conversation a couple years ago with um, a representative from um, David Joyce's office, who's the Republican uh, congressional representative from uh, the 14th district in Ohio, which, which many of us in Ashville County find ourselves in. And, um, and, and him and I would go back and forth and, and agree and disagree about different things, but we were talking about gerrymandering in particular. And he, we both agreed that gerrymandering was bad. And what a more equal playing field would do. If we got more folks to vote, if we had uh, fair, fair districts, what we would see is better candidates <laughs> for both parties, better candidates. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, more engagement means better candidates. Mm -hmm. It does look like we have a question. Um, so Rhonda, were all those uh, black congressmen in the pictures you showed former slaves before emancipation? Uh, not all of them, but most of them were. Not all of them. Um, and because of party realignment, and realignment is when, um, when a party goes from one ideological stance to another. Um, so one of the reasons that um, the, the, the modern day Republican Party, the modern day Republican Party talks about itself as being the party of Lincoln. And that is true in name, but it's not true in ideology. Um, because during that time, the Republican Party were, were, was considered the more quote unquote liberal party and the Democratic Party was considered the more quote unquote conservative party. So um, a lot of those, um, those congressmen and senators were also Republican, right? Because the party, it was the, at that moment it was the true party of Lincoln. Um, but we've had a realignment, right? So now the current Republican Party um, ideologically is conservative and the Democratic Party has realigned um, into a more quote unquote liberal stance. So, so that was part of what was going on with that too. Uh, Ms. Williams or Dr. Matthews, could either one of you speak a little bit more to the impact of the Shelby Holder uh, case in 2013, specifically on the uh, the elections that followed. So a couple of the films that I linked up in the Padlet and, and that I've watched really talk about, um, and, 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 and Ms. Williams, you had the RBG quote, you know, we're, we're taking away the umbrella in the middle of the rainstorm because we're not getting wet. Mm -hmm. um, what, what impact does that have, especially as we move towards what is the HR1 with the For the People Act? Yeah. Um... I just want to say I'm not a statistician, I'm an advocate. So in terms of the data, well, I have done some research, but <laughs> my research for my work is in a very narrow area of consumer protection. So I defer to Dr. Matthews 
But from an advocate standpoint, what you definitely see is more states introducing and passing legislation um, who in the past couldn't get any of that, their um, policies implemented without um, the preclearance approval of the United States Justice Department. I um, in the past, um, you know, before, you know, they could try to pass legislation, but it couldn't go into full implementation unless the Department of Justice gave approval. Um, and I think that's an important example um, of this balance between states' rights and, um, uh, and the role of the federal government, which is what we've been talking about with the For the People Act. Um, because the federal laws and legislation and policy supersede state, state action, um, it's important because we have already seen what states will do and have done when they're not under uh, the authority of the federal government. They pass laws that restrict and suppress votes. Um, we've already seen it which is why the For the People Act should be passed um, um, as quickly as possible. Uh, within within uh, 24 hours of the passing um, of, um, uh, of the decision, um, Mississippi and Tennessee submitted uh, voter restriction, voter suppression bills in their houses. 24 hours. They had that shit ready to go, right? Um, and um, other, other by the end of the week, um, several other states had followed suit. Um, you know, one of the, um, one of, I can't remember if it was an article I read or if it was an interview that I, that I watched, but um, um, wh whomever was talking about it, it was a historian, um, was taught a political scientist, I'm sorry, it was a political scientist, um, said that um, it broke America. And I, and I think that's a bit hyperbolic because vis-a-vis -vis voting, America has never really been fixed, right? I mean, you saw that long list of the timeline, right? I mean, you know, indigenous people didn't fully get the right to vote until 1972. 1972, y'all, I was 10 years old, right? So, so, but I think what it did was it allowed um, for um, a regression, a rapid regression into Jim Crow policies, um, which is where we're hurtling towards at this point. There was a, a couple comments. Uh, Lorna mentioned about the another voter suppression tactic has been the drop boxes, and we've we've seen that kind of come to head um, in Ohio and in other states. Do either one of you have any insight into the voter? Um, yes, the, the the submission boxes, drop boxes. Um, one of the things I read. I don't know. Have you have you? Um encountered this, um, Kalitha, but one of the things that that um, that I read and it prompted the way that I voted uh, was that was that there were many stories um, about voter boxes, shenanigans with voter boxes, right? Oh. Um, sometimes people weren't um, um, picking them up. Sometimes people were stealing the boxes. You know, we didn't know if if the votes that were placed in boxes were getting delivered, in some instances, they weren't getting delivered to um, the courthouse. Um, and so, but that's really all I know. I, I, a lot of it was anecdotal um, information, but here's what I know. The effect was, the effect of those stories was that people stopped using the drop boxes as much. So, for instance, here in Pennsylvania, when I went to drop off um, uh, my ballot, um, people did the same thing I did. They bypassed the drop box, which was right there at the front door, and they went <laughs> into the building. So when I walked into the building, the line was literally right where the, um, the security equipment was. I mean, it snaked all around the building because people were just, I just, I'm just, I'm going to put this in somebody's hand. 
Lorna, Lorna worked the polls. I remember hearing little stories of that. No, oh, put it in the box. And everybody wanted to come in and spread oh, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I live in um, Columbus and I'm in Ohio and I'm in Franklin County. And in order to counter that, what they did is they actually, you would pull up in your car and they would have someone who would take your ballot and you can see them put it in the box. Oh, like, okay. okay, we got your ballot and we're putting it in the box. And I kept thinking to myself like, this is really interesting. You know, I, I know in my public policy work, I, you know, you're always trying to find this balance between, you know, um, standards like federal or state standards and then giving people local control. Like, well, we know our community, we know people have confidence. There's a culture in our community that would support this versus um, something else. And I think that's, you know, where uh, the role of organizations, good government organizations like the League of Women Voters and local NAACPs have a critical role to weigh mm -hmm. in to make sure that, you know, this power imbalance that Dr. Matthews discussed is balanced um, by nonpartisan groups and not being driven by political interests, right? You know, um, I, you know, in Franklin County, there was a huge fight around uh, 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 education ads. So in the past, the Board of Elections always had a budget. Our local Board of Elections had a budget to do ads to promote people voting. And they do radio ads and, you know, PSAs, and they had a budget for it. Um, but there was a, a was, I called it the showdown at the OK Corral. And there wasn't a majority vote to um, do it. They were like, no, the, you know, the Democrats wanted the ads, Republicans didn't want the ads, they didn't think they were necessary. And then our county commissioners got involved and said, well, if the Board of Elections is not going to authorize this, we're going to do it. And I remember thinking to myself, like this, I mean, we're talking about just not political ads, just voter education ads. Um, and how something you think would be so benign can be political. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I, again, I just think that's the critical role that, you know, League of Women Voters and NAACPs and Common Cause chapters across the state really have an important opportunity to weigh in on disputes like that and can, um, you know, really have an opportunity to take the nonpartisanship out of it and take the high road and say, this is what's best for our community. Um, so, you know, I saw in the comments from Mary, like, yes, we have someone who attends all of our Board of Elections meetings, which I think is fantastic. Um, and just really keeping the relationship, the doors of communication open um, so that they know like, hey, we're on the ground, we're talking to people, and this is what works for our community. I think that's really important. Um, because um, because organizations that are nonpartisan are not trying to tell people who to vote for, what your position should be. Um, the role of organizations um, such as that is to clear the path for people to participate, not to tell them how to participate, not to tell them how to vote, but to clear the path, right? We're just, we're gonna clear it and we're gonna make sure that everything is smooth sailing for you. So no matter what your position, no matter how you want to vote, you get to do it, right? Unencumbered. That is the purpose of non nonpartisan organizations. And I, I think that, I don't think, I know, um, they they have to be they have to have more power to um, um, to ensure that people get the right to vote. That's everybody deserves that right. Everybody deserves it, and so um, and they deserve it unencumbered. So I don't 
I mean, while I think that you can have people in um, in the political parties talk about these things, and clearly we do, because people, you know, people in political parties are making these laws, right? They're or or they're having lobbyists write these laws and bring them to the the um, the the state houses, right? So so those people do exist, but I would argue that the role of the of nonpartisan groups. Um, is to is to sound the alarm, right? To ring the bell and say, I don't care what this party says, I don't care what that party says. What I want to do is make sure that anybody who wants to vote can do so without impediment. Um, and I don't, I don't know that we have enough of that. I, I really don't. Well, and, and Dr. Matthews, you and I have talked about this personally too. It's uh, it's also about who who folks trust. Right. And, and so there's organizations that different groups will trust with information and, and others not. And so when it comes down to, like Ms. Williams said about education, civic education, I mean, this is, this is an issue the league has taken, the NAACP has taken, you know, that folks need an education on civic engagement and, and that, that being absent in the, in the discussion. I know when Liam was in school, in high school, anyway, my son, you know, they, they, there was, he was, he was in a, uh, like a, a, a class of an AP political science class. And it was during the election and they weren't allowed to talk about it because mm -hmm. it was getting heated. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, wait, you, they can't, wait, what, what's going on? So it's mm -hmm. like, there was a moment that they could have discussions, but then when the election rolled around, there was no more talk because it was partisan. And it was like, wait, so they're, they're, if we don't talk about the laws and the rules and how gerrymandering happens and how districts are drawn and how, you know, how these rights have been, have a historical legacy, right. guess what? You know, we just keep repeating ourselves. Right. Facts are facts, and and one of the one of the problems that we have encountered um, in our uh, discourse of late is that people don't know that, um, you know, they don't they don't uh, you you know we have we have um, we have such there is such a propagandistic uh, bent to our media that people don't know how to have discourse anymore, right? And and that impedes participation. And it, it absolutely does. And so, again, I say that I think that nonpartisan um, organizations uh, can step into the breach. I, I really do think that because there is a breach. Um, and I think that they can do that. I think that's a service that is necessary um, if we're going to continue to have a participatory democracy. And let's hope we do. I think we all we we we're all we're all we're all we're all on team democracy. <laughs> right. But we have but we can't hope for it. We have to work for it. And Absolutely. We have, we have to participate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what other, I, I want to kind of kind of tie things up. If, what other questions do we have? Are there any other folks that would like to ask our fabulous guests any questions? Well, then I'm going to take this as a moment to wrap it up. I'm actually going to give Ms. Williams, Dr. Matthews, would you like a last word before I succinctly close up shop? <laughs> um, yes, I think that it's important to understand the through line. Um, that is how um, th that is how I think about everything. Um, you know, you can't talk about what is happening. Uh, in our current um, state of politics, uh, governance, social life, economy, whatever. You can't, you can't understand what's happening now without understanding what happened before it. Um, and so I think it's very important that we consider the through line um, when we're talking about what's happening in our current political era. Yeah. Um, well, again, thank you um, so much for inviting me. Um, for me, you know, I'm an advocate and I just encourage, you know, everybody to engage. I um, mean, that we should look at enfranchisement. It's not like well, I'm just focused on enfranchising people yeah, like me or people like me or people that I like. Um, I think it's important that we get invested um, at every level to make sure everybody is enfranchised in voting. Um, and that includes our neighbors, um, people in other communities, and that any effort to disenfranchise voters is, um, we should all take it personally. Like, wait a minute, that's my neighbor. That's my, this is my community. 
and any efforts um, to take away the citizenship rights of any American should be, we should see it as an attack on our democracy that we are all focused and invested in, in, in eradicating. Um, I know tonight we talked about uh, this issue in the lens of racism, and I'm really glad to know that, you know, the League of Women Voters, which, you know, predominantly is an organization of white women, um, is invested in this work for all people in all Ohioans. And I hope that we continue to, and your organization continues to stay in that vein. Thank you. And thank you for your time. And I agree. And I'm, I've been proud to be both a part of both the League and the um, NAACP. Um, you know, and, and I watch what comes out national in the state and the local level, and I'm proud of the work that folks are doing um, at each one of those levels. And one of the things that I can't let this quote go, because when it, when you, when you put it up there, uh, Kletha, I was just like, Rhonda seeing this, like, I could, I could see her face, even though I couldn't see her face. And that, and that was Shirley Chisholm's <laughs> quote. Shirley Chisholm. Yeah, because we were talking that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's kind of been a philosophy of mine. And I hope that's a philosophy of everyone. And I know there's some there's some rooms, you know, we just kind of bring our own chair and flop mm -hmm. it out and have a seat. And um, it's it's okay because if we're not there, uh, it's the business is gonna go on. So we wanna be literally in the room where it happens. So mm -hmm. get in the room where it happens, get out there, get out to vote. Um, and get others to do so as well. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody attending this evening. Thank you for um, spending the evening with us, Dr. Matthews and Ms. Williams. I appreciate your, your time. This video will be available on our YouTube uh, channel. It probably will take a while to download, so watch for it in the next few days. And uh, thank you again for your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.